Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my very special guest is veteran cryptozoologist Eric Altman. Eric has founded a number of cryptozoological societies, research organizations. He's a veteran podcaster and also a member of MUFON. Eric's bio and his website will be on our website, the, the Cosmic Switchboard Show, as well as our dedicated YouTube channel. And Eric's resume is so long, it would just take up too much time to read it at this point. <laughs> so without any further ado, Eric Altman, welcome to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to talk with you today. Uh, I've been looking forward to this interview, Eric. Uh, before we started, we were talking about, you know, the old school mentality of grounding ourselves in, in the work of those who came before us. We're kind of a generation where we had to get started before the internet. We had to go to libraries. We had to, I, I learned a lot, believe it or not, from comic books, because a lot of the comic books in the old days, actually, uh, there would be short stories about real events that had happened, you know, cryptid mm -hmm. uh, uh, stuff and also UFO related stuff. C could you walk us through that process of how you first became interested in the subject? What were the milestones in your life? And how did the, the work of those who came before you uh, you know, provide a framework, a groundwork for the work you're doing now. Well, when I grew up as a kid, um, and most of us that are in this describe ourselves as a weird kind of kid. Um, you know, we we don't fit into the norm. Um, we're not fans of, of typ typically normal subjects. I was a fan of um, science fiction, horror movies that were out in the day, the, the old cheesy horror movies. Uh, and I, I was always fascinated by the strange and un unusual. So growing up as a kid, um, I watched a lot of these movies on Saturday after mat afternoon matinees on TV and, and just really kind of fell in love with the subject. And it was probably in 1980 that I saw a movie that really pushed me into wanting to learn more about the field of the, the strange and unknown. And that film was called Legend of Boggy Creek. It was a Charles Pierce movie that was released in 1972. Uh, it was... I would call it a docudrama because it was uh, based on real events that occurred in a small town called Falk, Arkansas, um, down in the southern part of the United States. And uh, it involved um, the townsfolk who lived there encountering and sighting a creature that they, they really didn't have a name for at that time. They didn't know what it was. It was some kind of upright, hair-covered creature that haunted and stalked the game, game lands and, and animals. Um, it tormented the people with road crossings, peering in windows. Um, it's just a whole lot of weird phenomenon people were having the experiences. So Charles Pierce made a movie about it in 1972 when it was released. And I saw it in 1980. I didn't get to see it at the drive-in, unfortunately. But in 1980, I did see the film. Um, and I was fascinated by it because, as I said, I'm, I'm a fan of horror and science fiction movies. And here's a possibility of something like this actually being real. So I was really curious to find out if there was anything to it. Uh, maybe perhaps, you know, go to the library and find a book on it or, or try to, to study it and see if there was really such a thing as a hair-covered creature roaming swamplands, forests, uh, parts unknown. And um, I went to my local library in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, my hometown, and, and I was actually shocked to find they had books on the subjects. Um, they had books on um, Bigfoot, Loch Ness Monster, different cryptids, UFOs, haunted houses, uh, ghost stories. They had a pretty pretty large section, actually. So I started to encompass myself in, in reading these books and, and, and devouring the information because I wanted to learn as much as I could. And um, from those books, I went on to start to research newspaper articles. And it was a shock and a surprise to me that there were newspaper articles written about my hometown where there was a flap of sightings just years before I had gone to the library. So I, w I was literally stunned and, and especially so to find out some of these sightings took place mere miles from my home. So I began to read these newspaper articles and magazines and, and just started gaining this hunger, this knowledge, this hunger for knowledge and thirst to learn so much as I possibly could. And there was so much out there at the time as far as newspaper ar ar articles, magazine articles, the books at the library. Even my junior high school had books on these subjects. So I started reading them and, and really getting to know the stories. 
and, and learning that there were people and individuals that were out there actually doing this field research. They were going out there and looking for these, these cryptid creatures. Um, they were searching the skies for UFOs and possible landing locations. There were paranormal investigators exploring haunted houses and castles and, and, and haunted locations. So I, I was hooked as a kid. And, and I thought to myself, you know, if I ever want to do this one day, if I ever want to be like these people, that are doing this, I've got to educate myself. I've got to learn as much as I can because like, like with any, any sport or any, any, like if you want to be a plumber or if you want to be a musician, you have to learn the trade before you pick up a guitar and just start playing. You have to learn how to fix a toilet just before you walk in there with a wrench and start beating on the top of the toilet. You know, you've got to learn what to do before you do it. So that was my mentality. And Fortunately for me, I had a gentleman who lived in my, my hometown that I learned through the, the newspaper articles um, that was doing this research. His name was Stan Gordon. And Stan Gordon is a very well-known ufologist. Um, he's a very well-known cryptozoologist. Uh, he's, he's a study of, studier of all things Fortean, and uh, he, he's living in my hometown. Um, during the 1973 73, 74 flap of Bigfoot sightings and UFO sightings here in Southwestern PA. He was the chief investigator. I mean, he had a group, he was out there doing it. So um, I wanted to meet Stan and I figured, well, if this was an opportunity to get to know somebody in the field that was doing this kind of research and learn firsthand from somebody, that's what I wanted to do. And in 1983, 13 years old, I, I discovered that they were having a, um, a UFO Bigfoot exhibit at the local shopping mall. So I begged my parents to take me out and leave me off for the day to, to go to this exhibit. And I literally spent the entire weekend at the mall um, over, looking over Stan's UFO um, articles, his pictures, his casework, um, his documented casework, Bigfoot cast that he had cast in 1973, and talking to Stan in person. And what was really cool for me, and I'm sure you, you probably can relate to this or your listeners can relate to this, if you're a fan of baseball and you have one particular baseball player that's, let's say, your favorite and he's a star to you and you look up to this guy, it would be like walking up to that baseball player or football player, hockey player, whatever, soccer player, meeting that person and that guy actually looking down at you and saying, hey, man, good to meet you and talking to you one-on-one -on -one and treating you like a person. Well, that's exactly what Stan did. I'm a 13-year-old kid bugging Stan for information, and instead of walking away and ignoring me or saying, go away, kid, you're bothering me, he took the time to talk to me, answer all the questions I had, and I had some crazy questions at the time, of course, but he took the time to talk with me, get to know me, I got to know him, and from that point forward, we built a lifelong friendship. I'm still very close friends with Stan. He's my mentor. Um, I work with him on many cases together. We've, we've been friends for almost gosh, 40, 40 years now. So uh, but getting back to educating myself, I thought that was the key to getting into field research is to have a solid foundation of understanding um, the, the subject matter, understanding those who are researching and the techniques that they used and they incorporated and what worked for them and what didn't work for them. So when I got to the point where I was ready to start field investigating, I was able to take that knowledge that knowledge base, that foundation, and actually put myself out in the field and, and not start as a brand new person, not knowing what to do, but having some kind of background, um, some kind of tools at my disposal, educational tools at my disposal to step into the field without, you know, basically without a net. Stan Gordon is one of the all-time greats. I've been trying to get him on my show for a long time. If you put in a good word for me. That 1973-74 flap UFO, uh, big, <clears throat> excuse me, Bigfoot flap is an all-time classic in our field because it, it shows where the twain meets. That you know, this is all the same planet. There's no differentiation between the ET phenomena and the Sasquatch phenomena. At some level, they intertwine. So that field research he did really set the stage for um, a, a lot of us <clears throat> that came later. Now. There comes a point in time, Eric, where I don't know if it's a case between what came first, the chicken or the egg, but you know, we, we ground ourselves. I went through a similar process of reading all the work as much as I could find of, of the UFO researchers and Fortean researchers who came before me. And over time, I realized that I was having experiences too. And I don't know if it was because I was predisposed to the subject or maybe 
perhaps because of my delving into the subject, it kind of drew it to, towards me. It was one of those what came first, chicken or the egg things. Along the way, did you begin to find that this subject matter was not something necessarily at an arm's length, but at some level you were enmeshed in it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I started out not necessarily a UFO researcher or a, a ghost hunter, if you will, a paranormal investigator. Um, my main interest, because of the, the film Legend of Boggy Creek, was cryptid creatures, specifically Bigfoot. I was drawn to it, and, and I just had this passion that I had to know if this thing existed. And as I said, I, I started learning about these cases at a very young age, studying them and incorporating them into my field research. And when I first got into the field, I wanted to learn, before I started investigating cases and talking to eyewitnesses, I wanted to go see these places historically where there had been sightings and, and see the terrain, see the area, see what it was like. And I went to these places and I would stand there and I close my eyes and I would just try to put myself in the position of that eyewitness, thinking, okay, this person was here, this is what they experienced and try to get maybe a better understanding of what they dealt with being that I was in their, their environment that they were years prior or months prior, whatever the case may be. And, and that was interesting because it really put me in that mindset of perhaps this is what the witness felt, or this is what the witness experienced. And as things progressed and I began to actually talk to eyewitnesses and go to those locations, um, I got to get a better understanding of what they were dealing with simply from interactions with them, seeing body language, seeing motions, seeing the fear that they relived or the, the curiosity or the intrigue that they, they experienced from their encounter. And I really, I began to realize that there was something more to it than just newspaper articles you'd read about. This was actually a real phenomenon. And finally, when I did get into going out in the woods, um, investigating by myself, because I consider myself both a proactive and a reactive researcher, proactive being that I don't wait for cases. I go out to known areas where there's been sightings and activities, and I sit out in the field, and, and I spend hours and days and nights and, and weekends and all seasons you know, trying to, to catch data, trying to catch evidence, trying to use the techniques that I learned to get resp response calls or wood knocks back or possibly see tracks or have a, a, an, an encounter. And I began to have these little weird nuances begin to happen as I went out on these um, field trips or these outings in the woods. I would hear wood knocking or I would hear a scream in the woods that I couldn't identify as, as a common animal or common wildlife or, or I have rocks thrown at me. And that was really intense because it began taking me from the mindset of could this possibly be real to the yeah, other really might be something to this. Um, I'm actually experiencing it, not just reading about it, not just talking to eyewitnesses. This is actually happening to me. And the longer I spent out in the woods, the more time I spent out in different places around the country, I began to have weird experiences out in the forest. Um, I've had a possible UFO sighting um, back in 2014 while I was out doing Bigfoot research up on a mountain. Um, I, I have some weird things going on here in my home that I believe my home might be actually haunted. And, and I don't know necessarily if it's the phenomenon is attracted to me because I'm attracted to it or if it's more of a perceived perception because I'm so interested in the phenomenon that I'm seeing things that you know, I nor probably wouldn't notice if I wasn't in the, into the field, if I went out for just a hike in the woods or, um, you know, just went camping somewhere and had something happen. But I, I've, I've had some really weird experiences, strange things happen that I, I scratch my head and, and think, man, what the heck was that? Was that something that I'm reading about that could be real? And it, it makes me, it gets the adrenaline pumping, pumping it gets the, um, the emotion going, it gets the curiosity factor like way beyond 10 so you keep doing it, and the more you keep doing it, the more experiences you have, and, and yeah, it, the stranger it gets. One of the things that I found in my research, and in no way would I compare myself uh, Sasquatch-wise with a researcher of your caliber, but from what, what I've come to understand, and keeping in mind Stan Gordon's seminal work in field investigations back in 73 and moving forward, there is a feeling among some of us that there is more to at least some of the Sasquatch, not saying that they're all exactly alike, but at least some of the Sasquatch seem to have a spiritual, metaphysical, interdimensional, if you will, uh, quality to them. 
sometimes people have described mind speak uh, for lack of a better term when they've uh, had experiences where it seemed either in a dream or in a waking or an altered state of consciousness some of these beings seem to have communicated with them and and other people describe paranormal happenings marbles appearing in midair that kind of thing um, over time have you experienced any of this on your own or have you spoken to people that have had similar experiences of, of a metaphysical bent actually both um, when I first got into the field in 1997 um, I was privileged to meet a gentleman by the name of David and David lived in upstate Pennsylvania near the New York border and he was introduced to me by a fellow Bigfoot researcher and this gentleman said you got to talk to this man he's got some really strange things going on uh, that are possibly Bigfoot related, but they may be out of the norm of what you might have read in books. And um, so I had the opportunity to meet David, met his family, wonderful people, very down to earth uh, country family. They live out on the farm, um, pretty far from any civil, really developed civiliza civilization. And he was having experiences with what he believed were Bigfoot creatures, but these weren't your typical. Bigfoot creatures that you would normally hear about from a book or especially from the 70s, uh, 80s, um, from the Pacific Northwest. His were more um, watching a creature as it walked across the field and dematerialized or rematerialized. Um, he would see part of a creature leaning out from behind a tree but wasn't able to see the rest of the body when he should be able to see the rest of the body. So he had these things going on that were not normal, uh, not normal encounters I would call them for, for at least my perspective and I, I got to know him really well a matter of fact after gosh 20 plus years in the field he and I are still good friends I just talked to him on the phone a couple months ago we keep in touch and um, with him I never questioned his experiences I never thought he was a crackpot or you know he was making it up or maybe hallucinating I mean he was very matter of fact about what he was he was encountering and he told us right from the point look, guys, I'm, I'm going to tell you about this. And if you want to believe me, fine. If you don't, fine. I'm not going to make, try to force you to believe what I'm experiencing. But this is what's happening. And I found it really unusual that he was so open and honest about it. Um, he wasn't looking for fame or fortune. He wasn't trying to get his name out there to be a big celebrity or get in the spotlight or, hey, look at me kind of thing. He was just saying, this is what's going on. If you want to believe it, believe it. If you don't, you don't. And I did spend several weekends with him on his property and the surrounding forest and, and some of the state game lands. And we had some experiences that were pretty, pretty intense. Um, we heard something very large breathing and growling at us through a parabolic microphone that was probably about 50 yards away. And although we had um, night vision and flashlights, we couldn't see anything, just a very thin forest line. We couldn't see anything there, but it was, we could hear it breathing and growling at us. So uh, still don't know to this day what that was. But we had experiences like that. We heard the wood knocking. We, um, we found several possible tracks where he told us, you know, he's seen these things before. So um, I knew there was something going on, and he seemed like a very believable person at what he was experiencing. But I'm, I'm fresh into the research. I'm fresh to getting into the field, so I wasn't sure really what to make of it other than he didn't seem to be making it up or lying. So I kept that tucked in the back of my head and just, you know, left it there for future reference that if I ever came across it again, I could reference back to him, his research, his encounters, his experiences, and um, maybe see if there's any, any kind of tie-in. But as I began to do field research, I, I tried to stick mainly to Bigfoot being a flesh and blood animal that uh, may be a missing link, or pro some kind of primate, um, some kind of relic hominid. Uh, maybe related to Gigantopithecus. Uh, I really wasn't sure, but I knew it had to be a flesh and blood animal. We just haven't discovered it yet. We haven't found out what it is, categorized it, or cataloged it yet. And the longer I've been in this, the more people I've talked to, the longer I've worked with Stan, I'm, I'm beginning to realize that even from my own personal experiences and seeing things in the woods, um, there's more to this than the animal just being an animal. It may have attributes to it that we don't physically understand yet, or we don't have the scientific ability to understand or comprehend yet. And these may be natural abilities. They may, these may that would be pheromones, ultrasound, um, maybe tele telekinetic ability, or not telekinetic abilities, but uh, telepathic abilities where it can communicate, like you said, mind speak. Um, I, I'm not saying that they definitely have it, but there's something there. And I think it needs explored 
more to really understand what's going on. And I've seen the strange lights in the forest and in, in very well-known hot Bigfoot areas. I've seen the UFOs in, in active Bigfoot areas. So I know there's something more to the phenomenon than just Bigfoot, but what it is at this point, I have no idea. One of the things that uh, some of the mystics and the elders and the medicine men, medicine women of the various uh, uh, tribal cultures around the world have talked about is some of these so-called cryptids, you know, that's to use our term, that they seem to be able to ingress and egress between worlds, that there is this notion amongst them that they seem to know in modern parlance where the portal entries are and how this may explain in part how they seem to the recipient to appear and disappear or to walk between a couple of trees and suddenly vanish or materialize coming out of a couple of trees and, and in seemingly full physicality or be partially invisible. Uh, what are your thoughts on that as far as the ability of at least some cryptids to be able to, as some of the ancients said, move in and out between worlds? Well, unfortunately, at this point, we don't have the technology to say that it does truly exist. So it's all, in my, my opinion, it's all um, the person's um, speculation, if you will, or, or opinion, hypothesis, whatever you want to call it. But I do put a lot of stock in what the, our, our first Americans, first tribal Americans talk about, even um, tribes around the, the, the globe. They talk about this having some kind of spiritual aspect or the creatures having some it being more spiritual than a physical animal um, moving between worlds, you know, our world and its world. And I don't discount that. I mean, I think there's a lot that can be learned from our past and from our ancestors and those that came before us. And, and that's why I think it's really important to not only study books, magazines, and articles from our past, but to listen to some of the, the First Nations people and to, to try to understand their stories. Now, unfortunately, on the internet, there's there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, what a lot of people put out, they they think this is what tri this tribe says, or what that tribe says. My best advice is if you're able to um, communicate with a First Nations tribe in your area or get to know some of the folks in that tribe, talk to the historians, talk to the storytellers, the um, the folks that keep historical records, and and ask them what their take is on the animals so you can get a better understanding of what they believe. But there's a lot there to be learned and understood. Um, unfortunately, at this point in time, we just don't have the technology for us to understand it ourselves. But I don't discount that as it possibly being uh, a reality. Has there ever been a time when you've been utilizing uh, video or audio equipment in places you knew to be uh, Sasquatch hotspots and the equipment seemed to be tampered with or malfunctioned just at the wrong time when it seemed like there was activity going on, some kind of nuanced activity that a veteran researcher would be familiar with. But just at that moment, for whatever reason, the audio or visual equipment just malfunctions. It's happened to us a few times. Yeah, we've, we've had batteries die. Like as soon as we get them out of the cases and we know we've charged the batteries or we put fresh batteries in and whether it's, um, night vision goggles or audio recorders, video recorders, camcorders, um, game cameras. Um, I've had game cameras that have been moved, not taken off a tree, but they've been moved where they've been focused on one direction here and they're moved to focus over this direction. But it never shows the animal that moved the game camera. It's almost as if something came up behind the camera and moved it to a different direction so it wasn't no longer focusing on that. Now, I can't rule out there. I can't rule out humans because we never saw what did it, but it's peculiar how it was faced at one direction and then off another one. Uh, an interesting case I had investigated just a few years ago here in southwestern Pennsylvania. Family had a farm where they were having sightings of these creatures. They had all kinds of weird paranormal phenomenon going on in their farm, but I was more interested in the, the Bigfoot phenomenon they were experiencing. And they had placed a game camera on the roof of this um, storage shed where they, they put their um, tractor and I think one of their backhoes in. And it was a pretty large shed. Uh, the gentleman, had, because of so much activity, he wanted to capture it on game cameras. So he focused the game camera on the hillside where they had seen these creatures in the past. And it shows 
the game camera shows focused on the hillside in like one or two of the shots, and then it shows focused like off to the, uh, the, the side almost in a couple of shots and focused up at the sky on a couple other shots. And this game camera was mount, mounted literally seven, eight feet off the ground. So for a person to walk up and just, you know, bump it or push it or move it, that'd be kind of difficult unless, you know, it was the, the only thing I could reckon logically it might be was if the landowner went out went on a ladder or climbed up on his equipment and moved it himself. But I don't see any reason why he would do that. You know, I don't, I don't see any gain for that, but we, I've, I've actually, the pictures that were taken from the game camera that show the game camera moved and it doesn't show anything in front of it that it should have captured in the range of vision of the game camera. The range of view should have taken a picture and shown something moving it, but it just shows the game camera moved and taking a picture of a different direction. So it's happened before. Um, like I said, we, we've had batteries die. Um, we've been, I, I used to use um, a handheld thermal FLIR camera. It looks like, a, it looks like almost like a, a pistol, if you will, um, and it's got a big screen on top and a handle at the bottom. And fully charged one night, we went out. We weren't even out more than 10 or 15 minutes, and we were hearing um, branches break, and we were hearing stuff moved around. And as soon as I pulled that, that thermal FLIR out, the battery drained instantly. It was dead. So that's happened a couple of times to us, yes. You mentioned earlier, Eric, uh, the, the issue of, uh, of sonic frequencies. And there's a lot of talk in the field about so-called infrasonics, how some of these beings, uh, not, not only Sasquatch-type beings, but perhaps even other cryptids, have the means to somehow emit a infrasound frequency, which engenders, whether it's fear, paralysis, immobility, whatever the case may be, or a, a compulsion to leave the area. Uh, have you ever felt that, you or your colleagues, when you've been out in these hot spots? Um, there have been a few times where I've been overcome by, uh, I guess the best way to put it is intense fear. Like, uh, we've got to leave now that we should not be here. This is not safe. And we've, the people I was with, we left. And it's just an all of a sudden overwhelming fear. I mean, it just hit me. I was fine before. Once we got back to the cars, I calmed down. I was okay. And I wanted to go back. But it's happened a couple of times. And I, I can't account that to infrasound. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was just my, my emotions getting the best of me or my mind getting the best of me. But it's happened. And they say infrasound is, is a frequency so low that we can't hear it. But yet our body can experience it. We can feel it and... Um, raised adrenaline, um, nausea, feeling sick to your stomach. Um, there's been cases documented where it, it causes paralysis, temporary paralysis. I know lions or tigers use it. Um, they have the ability to do that, and they use that to stun their prey. Elephants have it, and they use it. Um, they use it to communicate over great distances of land. Um, so I know there are animals that are known to have this infrasound, and perhaps if Bigfoot does have this infrasound ability or capability, they may be using it to intimidate us or to get us to leave their territory if they don't want us. Um, I've talked to other people that have gone through that same experience where they're, they're all excited to be out there in the woods, they're anxious to be there, and then all of a sudden they're hit by this overwhelming sense of fear, dread, um, it's time to go type of reaction, and they leave. Um, I, I don't know if that's infrasound or not, but I know it's, it's something that is real. It does happen. What are your thoughts about, lack of a better term, Eric, uh, markings like the, uh, the so-called asterisk, the wood structures? Uh, the, there are cases where people have seen trees bent over in a U-shape over uh, a trail. Uh, there are uh, examples of, of broken trees left along a trail where people had just passed from and on their way back. You know, the, seemingly almost as if it's a message to them in some way, either get out or you're trapped here or whatever the case may be. In your experience, is it possible, uh, what's the likelihood of, of these creatures, Sasquatch-type creatures, of utilizing trees as some form of sign or some kind of marking or for territorial purposes? Uh, I'm still on the fence about the, the tree markings and the stackings, the TP formations. I mean, I, I found them myself. I've been out with other researchers, and we've found them and discovered them. And some of them are quite intriguing. Uh, some of them, they are intricate, intricately woven together. The branches are placed in a way that it's not natural, that they fell that way. 
Um, I'm not completely sold that Bigfoot is doing it. Um, it, it's a possibility and I can't rule that out, but I'm not sold on it's strictly a Bigfoot phenomenon. They may be made by humans, hikers, campers, um, people out in the woods. And, and everybody says, well, nobody goes here. No, no, man, no people come out in the woods here. Well, we're here. We're out here researching. We're out here walking around. Why can't somebody else be out here? You know, and if the phenomenon is known as popular as it is, why can't somebody be out there cre recreating this phenomenon, making these bowed trees, pulling them down or putting trees together and weaving them. So I'm not completely sold on the idea that they are markers. Although I do know that primates do make some types of markers to, to kind of, I guess you call it, make a perimeter around their territory to let other primates know or other animals know that it's their territory to stay out of it. So I, I can't rule it out completely. And I've, I've seen these tree markers myself on many, many occasions. Um, so I'm still, it's still a mystery to me, but you'll, you may find this kind of strange and I get a lot of weird looks when I, when people ask me what I think about the tree markers. I don't get overly excited about them. Um, I, unless I, I take the time to really look and, and I see a massive one that's really intertwined and weaved together and there's some long logs or branches that are really heavy that would be almost impossible for a couple of guys to put together. Then I start getting a little more curious, but over for the most part, I'm just kind of like, eh, it's another tree marker. It's another branch break. You know, maybe it has a natural, natural logical explanation for nature or people or whatever. Yeah, all possibilities have to be ruled out. And instead of people yeah. jumping to the fantastic or, or the you know sublime, I mean, they could look into the more plausible uh, possibilities. And I see that in the field of ufology. I see that in, in cryptozoological research where people sometimes jump the gun and they just make assumptions that, you know, there's really no basis for it. Uh, a lot of us in the field, when we do certain types of research, sometimes we land on our feet, Eric, and we find ourselves at the right place at the right time. And like you said earlier, you go to where the activity is. You go where the hot spots are. Uh, for me back in the day, it was the high desert of Southern California, lots of uh, ET activity, reptilian activity, associated deep black military activity. And that went on for a period of like years where, you know, we would go to these houses where there would be active portal entries and all kinds of activity would be going on. And, and we, we lived it. We were immersed in it. In your research, you and your team have, have been investigating this, this ridge where all this activity seems to be taking place. Yep. And it, it seems to me that that's one of those hot spots. Could, could you talk about that? Sure. Uh, the area that you're mentioning or, or talking about is called the Chestnut Ridge. Um, the Chestnut Ridge is one of the furthest western ridges of the Appalachian Mountains. And it runs from Indiana County about 100 miles to the southwest into Preston, West Virginia. Uh, it's several miles wide and it borders several small villages like um, Blairsville, Derry, Derry Township, Ligonier, Latrobe, um, down into Connellsville, um, Dunbar. Uniontown, Farmington, and then down into Morgantown, West Virginia, that area there. So um, it's got a, a pretty well established, I guess you'd call it villages along the base of the ridge on both sides. Um, but it's also got a very well established history of strange and unusual phenomenon. And I guess the only way I could really label it is to call it a window zone. And what I mean by window zone, John Kill called areas of strange phenomenon window zones where you can look and see all kinds of weird phenomenon going on there. And that's exactly what happens there. It's not just uh, Bigfoot sightings, which are prevalent. It's not just UFO sightings, which are prevalent. It's not just um, other anomalous cryptids like um, large black panthers or, or black cats that are prevalent. It's not just thunderbirds that are prevalent. It's not just haunted locations that's prevalent. It's all of it. It's all of it that goes on all the time. It goes on year after year. It's, it's probably been going on longer than it's been documented. Um, and I know Stan has done a great job of documenting the cases he's investigated. I believe the first case he ever got was in the early 1930s, 1933. 
and, and a place called Indian Head where a little girl was, was having encounters with what she thought were first were cows, but they were actually Bigfoot creatures. And um, in the area year after year has strange phenomenon. And I've experienced weird phenomenon up on the, up the ridge on both the northern end up in Indiana County and uh, northern Westmoreland County to the southern end of Pennsylvania and Fayette County. And um, it, it's historically, there's just so much that goes on there. It's hard to even, we'd have to have a whole separate show on just what goes on there to really capsulize everything. But um, the Bigfoot phenomenon, it's, there's sightings every year, um, both on the northern and southern end, end of the ridge. I still get reports. Um, our team gets reports. Um, you, Stan gets tons and tons of UFO sightings. And I'm not talking just your typical disc-shaped craft or uh, diamond-shaped or the big, um, the flying V shapes, um, the deltoid shapes. We're talking balls of light, silver, uh, metallic balls, um, orange balls of, of light that change color to green and blue. Um, huge motherships that people have, have literally driven under the, the vehicle, their vehicle under this thing. So there's a variety of different types of craft that are seen. Um, the Thunderbird sightings, as I mentioned, they're, they're prevalent. They don't happen as frequently as the Bigfoot sightings do, but people still see these giant eight to 20 foot long wingspan birds, black in color, um, that they've never recognized. Some say they have feathers, some say they have like a reptilian skin, almost like a pterodactyl or a pterodon. Um, the, the black panthers and eastern cougar, the eastern cougar is not supposed to exist here in Pennsylvania. It was um, rule extinct back in the 1800s, but yet people still see them and they still see the black cats and they find these large tracks. Um, a new phenomenon that we have going on right now in the Chestnut Ridge, there's actually two, is the uh, upright canid or dogman phenomenon that's going on now where people are claiming they're seeing an upright walking lack of better term, a werewolf, um, but it looks more like a dog. It's up on its hind legs. It's very aggressive. Um, it's not like a Bigfoot would walk off. This thing stands its ground, growls, barks. Um, it's, it's it holds a very uh, defensive or aggressive stance when people encounter it. That's one new phenomenon that's been uh, reported the last couple of years. And there's a new one now that Stan is just starting to get reports of some and I'm really not even sure how to describe it. It's some kind of tall, thin, grayish, white colored entity, I think might be the best term for it that people have seen. Um, I know there's been law enforcement that's seen it. Um, there's people, common people that have seen it and reported it. Uh, it's almost like a, um, a slender man type of entity without the clothing on it. It's just like a all white being with real long arms, real long legs. And, and it's like nothing they've ever seen before. Um, Stan was actually given a photograph just this past year from an eyewitness who saw it near a stop sign and took pictures of it. And he sent the pictures to me to look at. And I'll be honest with you. I looked at the pictures and I couldn't tell what was in it. I've never seen anything like it before, but there was definitely something standing there behind the stop sign and Stop signs are usually about seven, eight feet in height, um, where the, the sign actually comes off the top of the pole. And this thing was about as tall as that, if not taller. So whatever it was in the picture was tall, thin, white in color. And I don't know, it, it, it almost, I couldn't recognize it. I, I had no idea what it was. But people are seeing these weird entities. And, and that's what John Keel said of window areas. It's an area of strange phenomenon that, that goes on year after year whether you call them a portal area or a window or um, I like, I like the term that uh, a Philadelphia news reporter called the area in 1989. I believe it was, he called it the uh, twilight zone of Pennsylvania. If anything weird's going to happen, it's going to happen on the chestnut Ridge. What are some of the reports you've gotten from law enforcement, uh, considering how they're out all hours of the day and night and you have to patrol and, and you know, somewhat obscure remote places. What are the, some of the stories coming back from them? Um, mainly some of the stories are road crossings um, where they're out doing a patrol and this thing, a Bigfoot creature runs across the road in front of their vehicle. As I mentioned, Stan had a, a police officer who reported to him that he watched this misty shaped upright humanoid figure 
float across the road in front of his vehicle into the field where it appeared to take on a more physical form rather than a misty shape to it, and then it disappeared into the darkness. Um, a, a police officer saw that, and, and he still to this day doesn't know what it was. And based on his description, I'm not sure I know what it is. But um, we've had reports like that. Um, I've talked to, especially on the Chestnut Ridge, there are a lot of um, environmental um, locations that need securing, like whether there'll be fracking areas for oil pumps or, or uh, gas wells, or there is a, um, an area up on the Chestnut Ridge, on um, the southern end of the Chestnut Ridge, where they were constructing the parts, materials to build um, the large uh, wind towers or windmills that uh, once they get spinning, they, they produce electricity. And um, there was, for about a three or four week period in 2009, there was a, a state constable who worked as a state constable as his full-time job and a security officer as his part-time job. And he was a security officer for that construction site because they had a lot of very valuable equipment, tools, materials, and, and whatnot on that construction site they didn't want stolen. So he was hired and he hired a team to monitor and watch that site and other sites where they were building the windmill towers. And during probably the last three or four weeks of summer in 2009, he and his crew had several experiences with what they believe was a Bigfoot creature coming around the construction site at night, screaming at them, throwing rocks. Um, they would hear them whooping in the woods, wood knocking. And it all led up to a sighting that the, the supervisor, the state constable, had in uh, 2011 when he actually saw this thing uh, come out of the darkness and approach the site. And it came right to the edge of where the, the site was lit by um, uh, lights around the perimeter of the site, kind of spotlights, if you will. And it came right to the perimeter of the site and just stayed enough out of the, the spotlight so it wasn't fully seen. But he could see it standing there. He could see the, the profile of it. He could see it look around a power board as it was watching him as he sat in his car watching it. And they stared at each other for a few moments before the thing disappeared back into the darkness. So I've talked to several law enforcement officers over the years who've had um, the cryptid types of sightings. Um, I haven't talked to any law enforcement that have had any UFO sightings, but I know of some personally that who've had, they've just never shared their story with me. They've shared them with other investigators or other uh, researchers. So I know there's a lot of... Uh, active law enforcement, retired law enforcement um, that are having not only cryptid encounters, but UFO sightings and even um, paranormal experiences where they're having going to go into a house that's haunted and, and having experiences in, in a haunted location. So yeah, there, there's some pretty interesting stories that are floating around um, that have been around for a while, actually. Are there any places uh, in Chestnut Ridge, Eric, in the time we got left in this first segment where there's been a lot of talk over the years uh, and the people that I've networked with have described this in certain regions where the UFO activity to, to cite, but one example is really concentrated in a particular place. Some of the eyewitnesses have seen them coming in and out of the ground. There's speculation that there may be an underground base there. Uh, there's other stories that may be related about underground sounds, uh, humming, tunneling, sounds, that kind of thing, and also a covert or at times an overt deep black military interest in a particular region. Have you or your team ever noticed anything like that anywhere along the chestnut? Well, as far as the UFO hotspots, um, that seems to be mainly in the northern part in Derry Township. There's been a lot of concentrated sightings um, near Ligonier and La Trobe on Route 30, which is uh, a large um, two four lane highway it, it varies on where you're at on the highway but um in that area it's a four lane highway and there's been a lot of ufo sightings in that section of the chestnut ridge and, and over dairy township um as far as underground humming and and metallic noises and the loud booming that occurs that happens mainly in dairy townships as well the northern part of the ridge people have heard that um in the last couple of years people have heard loud booming sounds um, that they can only describe as large explosions, but there's not an explosion to be seen or, or no one else has reported an explosion actually happening. They're just hearing the noise. That's happened in Fayette County in the southern part of the ridge. Um, I'm trying to think about, I don't know of any underground bases where people have seen them coming out of the ground in the ridge. 
Um, Stan would probably know more about that than I would, but um, as far as military presence, I know of only one story that occurred in Fayette County where um, a group of investigators, I was told the second hand, so I don't, I don't have personal experience or knowledge of it, but I was told second hand that a group went to do some hiking on one of the trails in the Fayette County area up on the, the ridge. And um, as they were coming out to their vehicles, they were met by a group of gentlemen in all black vehicles. Um, they weren't military marked, but they were dressed in military fatigues um, from the head to the toe. Um, they were carrying high-powered weapons, and they were going in the woods in a formation, um, which is untypical, you know, just a group of people going on a normal hike. Uh, they, they found it very odd and very peculiar that the, it, it was almost like a military training exercise, if you will. They showed up in very large military vehicles that were marked, pickup trucks, Humvees. Um, they, the group, I don't know how many were in the group, but it was a large group. They got out. They assembled, they went in the woods together almost on a routine training mission. And to be honest with you, nobody knows why they went in there or how long they were in there. The group that, that was on their way out just decided to leave and they headed out and it called it a day. Um, I've seen very large black helicopters flying over the ridge myself on a couple of occasions. Um, I, I, they weren't close enough for me to get a good identification or see if there were any markings on them. They were just black in color and they were flying pretty, pretty fast from, um, I believe it was it was uh, north to south, heading almost like they were going towards West Virginia, um, and they were heading pretty quickly. But I do know there are some military bases in Maryland and in West Virginia itself, so they might have been heading there. But um, that's really the only stories I've heard of any military activity or covert activity going on. Yeah, in the time we got left, a few minutes for the first segment, yes, we're going through a lockdown. Yes, a lot of the annual events, uh, Bigfoot-wise, have either been postponed or canceled. Uh, please tell our audience, Eric, about uh, some of the uh, conferences you've put together and uh, you know the, the nature of them, uh, the kind of people that you, you invite to take part in these things, because uh, I, I really would encourage anyone within striking distance to get to these conferences and to get around people like you uh, and, and, and your peers and find out uh, you know what, what's going on in the field. Sure. Um, I started organizing conferences um, in 1999. Um, I was a member of the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society, and it was a new organization of just people that were really interested in the phenomenon. And there were uh, actual serious researchers in it um, that were that wanted to get in the, the woods and do real research rather than just be a social member. So we decided uh, the, the two founding members, Steve Anderson and Henry Benton, decided to put together a uh, a little. Bigfoot researchers meeting, I guess, for enthusiasts and, and actual researchers. And that's all it really was. Probably about 30, 35 people attended. And Steve had to cancel um, attending due to an issue he was having with, uh, I believe, a, a relative's health at the time. So he asked me to take over and I kind of threw it together last minute and put it together, organized it. And we had a couple of guest speakers come in and talk. And it was just basically enthusiasts and people new to the field, learn, hearing from some people who have been experienced and, and what their seeing and hearing and finding and um, documenting when they're doing research. And we were sharing ideas kind of like a round table where we were discussing cases and stories and, and stuff like that. So it was kind of more like a, um, a town hall meeting, if you will, with one speaker, and then we would ask questions and that sort of thing. Um, from there in 2000, I decided to build upon that. And I had a couple larger group meetings that took place um, just north of Greensburg, Pennsylvania that I did for about two years. And that eventually evolved into what was called the East Coast Bigfoot Conference, where um, we held it at uh, a place called Pitzer's Townhouse Restaurant in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. And uh, we would bring in speakers from all across the country, um, those who were doing some really good, honest, serious work. And I felt could really contribute to those who were interested in getting in the field and, and learning. Because I, at that time, and I still have that mentality, is if you want to get in this, you've got to learn before you, you've got to crawl before you walk. You got to learn before you jump into the deep end of the pool. And uh, I wanted to bring in some of these speakers to not only inform the public, educate the public, but those who wanted to get into research and were serious about it so they could hear from people who were experienced. So we did that for about four or five. I think the last one we did was 2011. Yeah, it was 2011. We did the, the last conference. And I did about eight of them total. 
Um, the one we did in 2011 was a joint uh, conference with the Pennsylvania MUFON group. Uh, we did a Bigfoot UFO conference together. One day was all UFO lectures, such as Stan Gordon. Um, I'm trying to think who else we had there. Some pretty predominant researchers. Um, Stanton Friedman was there. Um, and as far as the Bigfoot end of things, we had Dr. Jeff Meldrum, one of the leading anthropologists, scientists in the Bigfoot phenomenon. So we kind of wanted to educate everybody on what was going on um, as far as the UFO side of things, as far as the Bigfoot side of things. And Stan actually le lectured on some of those, the strange tie-ins there might be between Bigfoot and UFOs. So it was kind of a well-rounded uh, conference in 2011. Um, I took a couple of years off from doing conferences and then I can't, cause there was, they were becoming a dime a dozen. Everybody's doing a Bigfoot conference anymore. And uh, I, I decided, you know, well, there's too many now. Um, you can go see the same people lecture at the same event everywhere. So why bother? You know, why try to continue to educate the people when they're, they're showing the same people are showing up at each conference lecturing and, and there's a conference right across the, the state line in Ohio. There's a couple in Pennsylvania. So I took, um, in 2016, I came up with the concept of not only putting together a conference, but incorporating um, what we do and allowing the people that attend to have their own experience and, and learning what it's like to Bigfoot research, to go out in the woods, to hike, to camp. And uh, that event was called the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Camping Adventure. And it was loosely based off of um, some folks in Ohio that had been doing a Bigfoot camping weekend where they were taking Bigfoot enthusiasts and researchers out to uh, Salt Fork State Park in Ohio. And uh, they were giving them a full weekend of just camping, doing Bigfoot research, letting them hike. And, and that was about the extent of what they were doing at the time. So I thought, that'd be a, I thought that was a great idea. And I wanted to build on that, bringing in well-known speakers um, to not only educate the public, but once we were done, the people that attended could actually go in the woods with those um, researchers and lecturers and learn from them and see what we do in the field and get a taste for themselves of what Bigfoot research is. To not only educate, but to, um, to give them that, that personal experience. And at the same time, I thought, you know, since we're doing this conference, why don't we make it a charity fundraiser and put some good use to the conference and actually donate the proceeds to a couple of the local charities in the area. So it started out as a charity fundraiser two-day event in 2016, 2017, it grew a little bit bigger. And this last one we did in 2019, it was a three-day event. Um, we had, I think, 12 guest speakers at the event over the entire length of the event. We had Bigfoot films they watched. We had a charity auction, which we donated to local charities. We had uh, celebrities brought in for the event, the people that you see on TV, um, like the guys from the TV show Mountain Monsters were there. Um, some known Bigfoot uh, researchers like Dr. Jeff Meldrum, Cliff Berrickman from Finding Bigfoot. Uh, Ken Gerhard, he's a well-known cryptozoologist. So we wanted to have some celebrities as well as um, real field researchers. And, and my objective for that conference, this past conference, was to give everybody a well-rounded, encompassed view of the Bigfoot phenomenon. So we had not only had people that spoke on the flesh and blood aspect of Bigfoot, but they spoke about the spiritual aspect of Bigfoot and uh, some of the interdimensional possibilities and some of the paranormal possibilities. So we had a variety of different lecturers talking on different subjects so that we gave everybody there um, the opportunity to see that there's more to this than just Bigfoot itself. There's more ideas, more theories. It's a venerable uh, rabbit hole that can open up to un unending possibilities. And that's what I wanted to try to encompass is teach people that, you know, this isn't just about a missing link or a, a giant North American ape. There's this train of thought that goes on in this field. And then there's this train of thought that goes off on, on this field. So I wanted to make it a well-rounded encompassed event and nobody had done that yet to my knowledge. So we put all that together. Um, we had a really successful event in 2019 and uh, raised some money for the charities and Hopefully, we'll be able to do it again um, in the near future. Great work, Eric. And, and what's your website name? Um, people can find me at ericaltman.net. Uh, and I'm also on Facebook. I've got several Facebook groups. Um, Weird and Mysterious Pennsylvania. Uh, Mysteries of the Chestnut Ridge, which I post articles about the Chestnut Ridge, whether they're current, old, uh, cases that I've investigated, videos, audio recordings. There's all kinds of great stuff about the lore and legends that go on on the Chestnut Ridge. So I have a couple of Facebook groups that I run, um, the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Camping Adventure group I run. Um, 
So I'm, I'm always keeping busy doing that kind of stuff too. Great. Well, I'm going to join those groups if that's okay. Uh, well, yeah, sure. Absolutely. We're just getting started, folks. We've had a fascinating discussion with our, our guest, Eric Altman. Um, you've been watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. If you like what we do, if you believe in what we do, please go to thecosmicswitchboard.com, sign up and become a member, and we'll see you at the top of the next segment. <laughs>